1947, Claude Shannon published an article entitled The Mathematical Theory of Communication. This article turned what was previously an art into a science because what he showed was that the communication using electronic means through a channel, that is over a radio or through a pair of wires or by microwave or what, by whatever means, could be characterized by mathematical models. Since that time, there has been a great deal of development in the area of communication. In the early days, the communications were all analog, mostly amplitude modulated. Later, with the advent of integrated circuits and faster transistors and other things, we began to have wireless communication, that is, communication of phones and other things, but primarily analog, until the integrated circuits and other developments that came out of the space program of the 1960s began to catch up to the needs for communication. At that time, wireless communication changed from an analog science to a digital science. So what I would like to do is, in this part, to talk a little bit about modulation and what the options are and why some options are better than others. Now, a modulated wave is a wave consisting of a carrier, the omega, sometimes modulated amplitude modulation by varying A, sometimes by varying the carrier frequency, omega, and sometimes by varying the phase. Now, as I pointed out earlier, the many of the early analog communication systems also used analog signals. In other words, signals like voice. Eventually, those signals began to be digitized. So today, a cell phone does not contain any analog uh, processing except for the purpose of turning for example, the voice into a set of digits that can then be uh, transmitted over a channel. There are a variety of modulation methods that have been popular, but invariably the digital methods have prevailed. Also, because amplitude modulation is subject to considerable distortion and interference from noise, and for reasons that we'll talk about later, FM, while superior to AM, is not generally used. And the reason is that phase modulation has proven to be the most effective way of modulating a signal that is composed of digits. Here are some examples of carriers modulated by analog signals. The first one is amplitude modulation, where the carrier's amplitude is altered by the modulation. The second is frequency modulation, where the as the analog signal changes, the carrier frequency changes. The third is phase modulation, where the phase of the carrier changes. A technique that's used a lot today is to combine both amplitude and phase modulation. The reason is that when you sort of run out of steam with phase modulation in a channel, you can gain some extra communications capability by introducing a limited amplitude changes. And we'll talk about that when we get to things like QAM, QAM stands for Quadrature Amplitude 
modulation. The uh, it's actually a combination of phase modulation and amplitude modulation. This is an example of amplitude shift keying. Normally when you see the word keying in a modulation description, it means that you're using digital signals. In this case, a zero and a one. When the signal is a zero, the carrier is at its maximum amplitude. And when the uh, baseband signal is a one, the carrier is at its minimum amplitude. This, of course, is called amplitude shift keying. Here is an example of frequency shift keying. Notice that the amplitude remains constant, but when the signal is a zero, the frequency is at a lower value. When the input is a one, the frequency increases to another value. So with a, a string of zeros and ones, the carrier shifts in frequency from low frequency to high frequency. One of these is usually called a mark, the one that is represents the one. The other is called a space, the one that represents a zero. And the early radio teletype systems used frequency shift keying. Phase shift keying is shifting the phase of a constant frequency carrier. Now notice the frequency of the carrier before the phase change and the frequency after is the same. The only difference is the phase has changed so that instead of this signal continuing to go up as it has been, it instead goes down. We have reversed the phase at this point when the signal went from a zero to a one. Now phase shift keying has been known for quite some time, but only with the advent of modern analog to digital converters and digital processing circuits that could run at high enough speeds has it become a prevalent means of modulation. Earlier I mentioned Claude Shannon and his mathematical theory of communication. This is a model of a communication system. Normally the input is called baseband. Now this can be an analog baseband signal like voice, but normally we're going to be talking about digital baseband. In other words, this is a string of zeros and ones. There is a carrier. The baseband and the carrier are combined in a modulator. Then that signal is amplified and put out through a channel. Now the channel can be anything. It can be a pair of wires, it can be a microwave link, it can be a satellite connection, whatever it is. The output of the transmitter goes into the channel. The channel causes that signal to be distorted in various ways. Noise is added, phase is shifted, uh, frequency can be shifted, other things. Basically everything about that signal gets altered by the channel to some extent. At the other end of the channel, usually the signal is so weak that it has to be amplified again. Then a carrier is applied to the demodulator along with the output of that amplifier. In phase modulated systems, a portion of that received signal amplified is used to phase lock the carrier. By that what we mean is if this system runs open loop, this carrier and this carrier, even if they are very close in frequency, over time they will drift. They will drift in phase and they will drift slightly in frequency. The purpose of this dotted line is to show that in phase modulated systems it is important to phase lock this carrier to the transmitted carrier. Then the receiver is able to demodulate the original signal in what is called a phase coherent method. And most of the things that we are going to be talking about, including the use of uh, quadrature modulation, uses phase coherent demodulation. One of the most popular ways of modulating digital signals, or that is using digital signals to modulate a carrier, is to use what is called a quadrature modulator. We'll talk about why that is uh, the preferred method uh, later. Right now, 
We're simply illustrating how a quadrature modulator works. Now this is a conceptual block diagram. There are two input channels. One channel goes through a modulator to produce an in-phase signal. That is, it is in phase with this carrier generator. Another input channel is put through a modulator to produce a quadrature phase. It is 90 degrees out of phase with the carrier. And here this minus pi over 2 illustrates a 90 degree phase shift. Of course pi is 180 degrees so pi over 2 is 90 degrees. Here is a typical digital modulator. It's called a quadrature phase shift keyed modulator. QPSK. The two input channels are created by a serial to parallel converter. In other words, there is a serial bit stream that comes in here. One bit is saved and applied to this channel. The other bit is saved and applied to this channel. So we're now transmitting two bits per symbol. That is, each time that this system goes through one cycle, it transmits effectively two bits of information. The outputs of these D-Day converters are then applied to these modulators. The modulators are fed 90 degrees out of phase just as the quadrature modulator that we saw earlier. So this is a quadrature modulator and then the Q and I signals are combined to an output. On the other end you need a QSPKD modulator, which we will talk about when we get there. When talking about phase shift keying, it's convenient to think of the signals in terms of the in-phase carrier and the phase shift. Now in a quadrature system, the in-phase is normally represented by the x-axis and the 90 degree or quadrature phase is represented by the y-axis. So a symbol is represented by a certain amount of I signal and a certain amount of Q signal. That's this point here. It has magnitude or amplitude equal to the length of this line, which is of course just the hypotenuse of a triangle, with one side being the Q and the other side being the I. Earlier we talked about frequency shift keying, where the frequency is varied depending on whether the input signal is a zero or a one. You can also vary the phase based on zeros and ones. So for example, this phase might represent the 1, and this phase might represent the 0. Notice that the, the phase is all along the i-axis. So this is 0 degrees phase, and this is 180 degrees of phase. When you use binary phase shift keying, the binary means that it only has two values. The phase shift keying means that the phase changes depending on whether that's a 0 or a 1 and there is one bit per symbol. We'll talk about symbols a lot in here. And the reason that we use symbol instead of bit is the symbol is what is actually transmitted over the channel. But a symbol can represent more than one bit in the, in the baseband. For example, the quadrature phase shift keying signal that we looked at briefly a minute ago has two bits per symbol. It not only changes its I signal, but it also changes the Q, or quadrature. So, for example, this point is a positive I and a positive Q, and so on. So, for example, this might represent 1-1. One, one. This might represent 0-0. Zero, zero. Now one thing that we'll learn about frequency shift keying, as long as the symbols change around the outside, 
we get less interference through the channel. When a signal has to go across the origin, in other words, it not only has to change phase, but it has to change both phases. That is, the I goes from negative to positive, and the uh, negative to positive, and the Q goes from negative to positive in this direction. Once that happens, the transition through the origin causes discontinuities in the channel that are harder to handle than where the changes from one symbol to another are around the periphery. Here is an example of a phase shift keyed signal. When the data changes from a 0 to a 1, the phase changes. When it changes from 1 to 0, the phase changes. Now this is binary phase shift key. In other words, it is exactly the same as the left-hand side of this diagram. Here is a representation of a quadrature phase shift keying system. Here the input is 1, 1. Here the input is 0, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0. As long as the changes are one bit at a time, in other words from 1, 0 to 1, 1, or from 1, 1 to 0, 1, or from 0, 1 to 0, 0, or from 0, 0 back to 0, 1. In other words, around the outside, you have a more well-behaved system. When the transition, for example, is from a 1, 0 to a 0, 1, notice that both bits change. The first bit changes from a 1 to a 0. The second bit changes from a 0 to a 1. Whether the transition is in this direction or in this direction, the fact that it changes both bits, in other words, goes through the zero through the origin, creates more problems for us. So there are communication systems that try to solve that problem. We'll talk about one of those a little later. Here is an example of a QPSK signal in which we are using two bits per symbol. Each of these is a symbol. Each of those represents two bits. So, the symbol transmitted is shown in this column. The carrier phase is shown in this column and the carrier amplitude in this column. Now the phase, of course, is just the phase relative to the zero degree line. So this is 45 degrees and this is 125 degrees. In other words, this is pi over 4. The, this would, of course, be 180 degrees. Uh, I said 125. I should have said 135 for this one. 225 for this one. 315 for this one. Notice that the carrier amplitude never changes. Remember, the amplitude is the length of the vector from the origin to the symbol. This is the same length as this, and this, and this. And it, the carrier amplitude always remains 1 in this system. That is advantageous because it's much easier to amplify a signal with a constant amplitude than it is to amplify a signal with varying amplitudes. And we'll talk about that a little later. Here is the first symbol with a phase of 225 degrees and a carrier amplitude of 1. Notice in this case, the 0, 0 is in this quadrant. Here, for example, is what that might look like. And each of these, the red will represent the current symbol being transmitted. The green will represent the positions of the succeeding symbols. So this is the first symbol. This will be the second symbol. Here is the second symbol, O1. Notice that the carrier has shifted phase to this point, but the amplitude has remained 1 
in this case, the third symbol is being transmitted. The carrier phase has shifted again, but once again, the amplitude has remained one. And finally, the fourth symbol is transmitted. The carrier phase is now 45 degrees, as shown here, but once again, the carrier amplitude is one. Here is an illustration of what happens once we pass that transmitted signal, that is the the phase shift signal, the quadrature PSK signal that we just illustrated, once we pass it through a noisy channel, and all channels have some amount of noise, the transmitted symbol in every one of these cases was the same. But due to noise and distortion, the phase amplitude of each of those comes through the channel in a different place. The purpose of the receiver is to try to group all of these signals together and call them all the same symbol. Now, obviously, as this pattern gets larger and larger until it begins to overlap this pattern, you begin to get errors. You set this symbol, but you received this one, or this one, or this one. Now one of the advantages of phase shift keying is we know that if we get something close to this, we know that it probably was this symbol that was sent. But as I pointed out, what if we get a symbol up here somewhere? Was it this that was sent or that was that was sent? And that's one of the issues that we have to measure in our communications systems. I mentioned earlier that if we could, we would like to avoid having transitions go through the origin. This is a QPSK signal, quadrature phase shift keying. There is a technique known as pi over 4, remember that's 45 degree, differential quadrature phase shift keying, I hope all these, all these uh, symbol names aren't uh, that confusing. But it's often called pi over 4 DQPSK or sometimes just pi over 4. It is a technique. We're not going to actually look at how that's generated, but later when we do some experiments, we'll measure one of these. Why is it important? Well, notice that no symbol transition goes through the origin. However, you do need now to have more symbols available. So the downside is more symbols. The upside is no transitions through the origin. Another form of keying is instead of just using four symbols, in other words, two bits per symbol, what if we use three bits per symbol? This is called eight PSK because there are eight symbols around the outside of this circle. Notice the length of each vector is still one. So there is no amplitude change, but there are eight different phases. The symbol rate, that is the rate at which we have to send symbols in this diagram, is one-third the bit rate. Why? because there are three bits per symbol. So each symbol represents three bits. Remember in BPSK, each symbol represented only one bit, and the symbol rate was the bit rate. What we will see is as we increase the number of available symbols, we basically increase the transmission rate for the same channel capacity. By channel capacity, I mean, the channel capacity is how many symbols per second can you send through that channel. If you can put three bits per symbol, you're getting three times as many bits through that channel as you would with only one bit per symbol. Here is a stylized diagram showing the difference between QPSK, which we've talked about, and offset QPSK. Now, differential QPSK that we just looked at a little bit ago is a form of offset QPSK. Because no transitions go through the origin, 
it is a system that is easier to handle once it's been generated, but we need more symbols. So a QPSK modulator will produce this constellation. In other words, this IQ diagram. However, it will allow transitions through the origin. An offset QPSK system, and we'll talk about some of those and show some of those in our experiments, has more symbols, but it has the advantage that none of those symbols transitions go through the origin. Over here is a type of diagram that we will also look at called an eye diagram. The purpose of the eye diagram is to show you how good the signal is. In other words, if the signal is always just at this point, or just at this point, the eye diagram will will open up, if you will. Eye wide open means good signal. With offset QPSK, notice that the eye signal goes through the center when the Q signal does not. And by through the center, I mean the this is transitioning while this one is holding steady. Notice that up here, these two are together. So if you do an eye diagram of a QPSK signal, you will get, with the I and Q, you will get open eyes on that are in phase with one another or coherent in time. If you do the same eye diagram with an offset QPSK, because there is an offset, one way you can think about it is, it's as though this signal were offset to the left. If you move, In your mind, if you move this to the left so that these now line up with these, you will see that that is what an offset QPSK signal does. In other words, the Q and the I are offset. That produces this constellation diagram and produces the advantage we talked about. In addition to phase changes, you can also use amplitude changes. Notice in this constellation diagram that this symbol and this symbol are both at 45 degrees, but this one is at lower amplitude than that one. Similarly, this symbol is at this phase, but its amplitude is somewhere between these two. This type of modulation pattern is called quadrature amplitude modulation. Quadrature because we're still using the 0 and 90 degree phase changes, but amplitude because the length of this vector can change. No longer is it, is it constant. This allows us to insert more symbols in the channel, which gives us more channel capacity. However, because now we have to be able to sense the difference in amplitude between this and this, we have to have a linear channel. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the experiments. By a linear channel, we mean that obviously there can't be compression because, for example, if you compress this signal through an amplifier, it becomes this signal or gets closer to it. Similarly, if you have a nonlinear amplifier where some signals are amplified more than others, this signal can get amplified all the way out near this one, and therefore it starts to become confused with this signal. So a quadrature amplitude modulated or QAM signal has some advantages, higher bit rates, but it has some disadvantages. You have to use linear processing techniques and linear amplifiers. Over on the left are the symbols, the carrier phase and the carrier amplitude. Notice in this case, unlike the uh, QPSK case that we considered earlier, the carrier amplitude changes. That's the A in QAM, amplitude carrier modulation and phase modulation. So QAM stands for quadrature, that is change in phase, amplitude, modulation. I have put together a little uh, graphic
that sort of illustrates what this goes through. So I'd like to uh, uh, take a look at that at this point. Here you see the first symbol being transmitted, that is the zero zero symbol. Now what I'm going to do is automate this and it will step through each of the symbols, showing the changes in phase and in amplitude that are produced with a qualm signal. Notice both the amplitude and the phase is changing. Each symbol has its own amplitude and phase. Some of the amplitudes are the same, but the phase are different. Some, the phase is the same, like those two, but the amplitudes are different. The last area that we're going to talk about is the relative power of these signals. Because when we measure the ability of a channel or of an overall system to transmit bits through a channel, we would like it to be as efficient as possible. That is, we would like to get as many bits through the channel as we can without too high an error rate, and we would like the transmitters to use as little power as possible. To do that, it's important to understand that the amplitude, for example, of a qualm signal, because it varies, the power, for example, needed to send this symbol is different from the power needed to send this symbol. The highest symbol power is called the peak symbol power. Now, in a QPSK signal, because all the signals are at the same amplitude, the peak symbol power is the average power. In a QAM signal, the average power is somewhere between the peak symbol power and this lowest symbol power probably somewhere about here. Here is what is called the power spectral density. And all that means is that power is represented on the y-axis. Spectrum is represented on the x-axis. By spectrum, we mean frequency. And this is the spectrum of power that a BPSK, that is a binary phase shift keyed signal, would produce. In this particular case, the, these samples were taken from an 80 megahertz carrier being uh, modulated at a 10 megahertz rate. Notice that every 10 megahertz, the power goes to zero. The power is at the highest at the carrier frequency. But every 10 megahertz, that is, at multiples of the modulating frequency or the data frequency, the power goes to zero. Now we look at what happens if we filter the baseband. Let me explain what you see here. At the top is the same chart you just saw. In other words, this is the carrier frequency. This is the power spectral density, which goes to zero at 10 megahertz intervals. That is if we do not filter the baseband. If we filter the baseband with what's called a raised cosine filter, and once again, I'm not going to do the mathematics on all of this. If you're in a course on communications engineering, you've already been assigned these mathematical exercises. We're trying to, to deal in the, the experimental, and in this case, all you need to know is if you're using a raised cosine filter in the baseband, this is the power spectral density. What is useful to know is a raised cosine filter concentrates most of the power in this area around the carrier. So if we now have to amplify this, we are not wasting as much power on the sidebands with the, the filtered baseband as we are with the unfiltered baseband. We are going to show
the use of a raised cosine filter in one of our experiments. And I wanted to illustrate, this is the same signal, that is an 80 megahertz carrier with a 10 uh, megabit per second data rate. But by applying a particular filter to the baseband before it is modulated, we can concentrate the power and thereby improve the efficiency of the overall system. The second thing we need to worry about when it comes to power is what happens to the overall power characteristics when we have nonlinearities in one or more of the amplifiers. At the top is a QPSK signal's power spectral density. Once again, power just means the amount of power in the signal. Spectral means what at each frequency. So this is the, the curve of power spectral density for a QPSK signal. If, however, we feed that signal through an amplifier that contains compression, this is what we get. Notice that the power in the band edges has gone up. For the same power at the carrier, we're now wasting a lot of power out here on the edges that we did not have to waste on the original signal. The effect of compression in an amplifier is to broaden the power spectral density, thereby making the system less efficient. And finally, this is the power spectral density of an 8 PSK. An 8 PSK is a phase shift keyed system where we use eight symbols instead of two. In other words, we use three bits per symbol. Notice what the power spectral density looks like for this. In this case, instead of the frequency being offset by 10 megahertz, remember this is still a 10 megahertz rate, the 10 megahertz rate would be halfway in here. Instead, now our peak is here and our minimum is at a frequency which is basically a third of the way. In other words, instead of every 10 megahertz, it's about every six and a third megahertz. Now, we can go to systems like this, which is a 16 PSK. An advantage of something like a 16 PSK is because it's constant amplitude, we don't need the linear amplifier, or at least it doesn't need to be as linear. However, we're now crowding the symbols and the ability to differentiate phase between this signal and this signal, or this and this, becomes harder, especially if we don't have a good carrier lock. In other words, if the receiver carrier is not carefully locked to the transmit carrier, we, get, we start getting trouble in distinguishing the carrier, the phase of each of these symbols. I've intended this part to be a non-mathematical introduction to all of the factors that you might want to consider in deciding how to set up a digital communications transmitter and receiver. In the next section, we will start actually doing experiments, and it is important that you understand the concepts we've talked about before we start doing those experiments, otherwise the experiments may not make a lot of sense. So let's go on to that section.